Thank you, thank you. Boy, when I came in, everybody was leaving. I, I thought Steve had really offended him. But then I thought, no, it had to have been Jack. So, but I don't want to start on Jack. We don't have enough time. So, uh, besides, I'm sure he's used all of my jokes because I t taught them all to him. And uh, but anyway, it's good to be back in Auckland and, and uh, a lot of familiar faces, a lot of uh, people I don't know, of course, but you know, this is a great country and and, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, it seems in us talking, you know, around to New Zealand, you really don't realize how great this place is, you know. So many uh, don't seem to understand what a blessing you have in this great country here. You really need to do that and uh, be thankful for uh, what he's done here and... Uh, You know, having a business background, uh, you know, I always look at business situations and all, and I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that. I believe rightly from the Lord, but uh, you have some of the best business minds in the world here in New Zealand. You really do. And if you had, uh, if these same people were in America, where you had that kind of marketplace and everything, I mean, they would be gazillionaires. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, but some of the principles that have been learned here and just the, the uh, great business minds you have here, I believe you've really got some of the best. And I believe some of the best church leaders. Uh, seriously. And uh, my, my point is you can't see yourself as just a small nation. And I know there is a sense of so many New Zealanders, oh, we're so far from everything, You've this feeling of isolation. But, you know, the Lord loves to use places like that to confound the wise. And people, you know, the small, the weak, what we would think would weak. And you really need to see the opportunity you've been given. Because, uh, you know, one person and the Lord can do anything. And I do mean that one person and the Lord. You know, the heavens he's given, it says the heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he's given into the hands of the sons of men. So he won't do things on the earth until we pray, till we ask him. He needs a mediator. He needs an intercessor. And uh, I really believe some of the great emerging ministries in the world are going to come from New, New Zealand. You already have some of them out there. You really do. And... Uh, but I believe we really need to first be thankful uh, for what we have, acknowledge what we have, be thankful for what, what, wherever the Lord has placed us. But to be alive today in these times and know the Lord, I mean, we could spend eternity thanking Him, and that wouldn't be enough. You know, just for those things. But uh, I do believe the Lord has extraordinary destiny upon New Zealand and New Zealanders. He's got you here for a reason. And, uh, and I'm going to try to get into some of that, okay? I'm just going to paint a broad brush. We're focused, trying to focus on the prophetic because that's one thing that helps to stir up the other gifts. That's why I said earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Prophecy tends to stir up everything else. So we do try to be obedient to that first, and so a prophetic vision and purpose and, and uh, understanding of the prophetic, but it's not what we do, it's what you do that counts. It's not what we prophesy, it's that you are able to prophesy. And, uh, but it says in John 10, 4, when he puts forth all his own, he goes before them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. So all Christians are called to know the voice of the Lord. That's basic, fundamental, we all know that. But we'll follow Him, I believe, to the degree that we know His voice. It says that sheep follow Him because they know His voice. 
And um, so this is one of the major fundamental issues, I believe, of a, a Christian life that is going to be anointed, successful, is following Him. You know, and being involved in the things He's called us to be involved in. I believe one of the number one reasons for failure in ministry is our tendency to, to take the people's yokes instead of the Lord's yoke. And that will burn you out very fast. You know, the Lord did not respond to human need. He only did what He saw the Father doing. He had compassion for human needs, but He didn't heal everyone, didn't feed everybody. You know what I'm saying? He followed the Lord. We'll, you know, His sheep follow Him because they know His voice. And we don't want to just be busy. We want to be busy about our Father's business. And this is what we're after. But uh, I believe you can know the Lord's voice but still not know what He is saying. Okay? Let me give you an example. I, if my wife were here, she could be in any crowd here and I could tell you exactly where she is because I know her voice. Okay. Basically, the only way we recognize someone is by two main ways. Their face and their voice. How many people do you know by looking at their hand? Or their arm? Or, I mean, it's face or voice recognition. And I think it's the same with the Lord. That's the only way we're going to know Him. So, but my wife knows French. And I don't know French. I know a little but, I mean, I can understand a little bit, but generally, I don't know that language. So she can be over here talking in French. I'll know right away, there she is, over there, but I'm not hearing what she's saying. Okay? The Lord does not usually speak to us in human language. It's a heavenly language. So if we're going to understand what he's saying, we're going to have to learn his language. And he could speak to us in English. Sometimes he does. Or whatever language is our native. He could speak to us in that. Usually he doesn't. I believe you'll find this is biblical. This is why he uses so often uses dreams, visions. I mean, his language is visual. I believe one reason for that is what John Amos Comenius said. A picture is worth a thousand words. But we need to discern and start to learn the language of God, the language of heaven. And I'm not just talking about tongues either. There is a language of heaven that if we learned, I believe we would all be speaking and understanding each other. And I believe that's what the gift of tongues was assigned for. It was a sign that on that day of Pentecost, remember it says tongues are for a sign, on that day of Pentecost, I believe that the gift of tongues was a sign that the church was going to be the antithesis to Babylon. Remember, in ba at Babylon, all men's languages were scattered, confused so they could no longer understand. What happened on that day of Pentecost? All men heard, in their own language, the glories of God. But he's, again, there's going to be a language that speaks to all men that all can understand, okay? That the church is going to be that. Now, why, did the, why was the Tower of Babel? Why did God have to do that? Because men tried to reach heaven by their own efforts. They thought their own works could get them there, their own genius. And they also built it to make a name for themselves. And then the third reason, it says, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth, and time after time after time, we tend to think this new project is going to get the people mobilized, keep them in unity, keep them together, never will. It'll always result, projects, if they become our focus, will always result in a greater scattering. Now, basically, you know, I go to a lot of countries that speak foreign languages, real foreign languages. I remember the first time I went to Finland, there was a sign. It had, it looked like 25 letters to one word. And I said, I said, what does that sign say? I mean, this is line after line, but it's all one word. I said, what does that sign say? He says, stop. 
<laughs> you know, Hungarian's the same way. I mean, it is. And then when the translator, you know, when I'm speaking, you share a little bit and then translator translates, I would take, you know, say one sentence and he would go on and on and on. I thought he was making up his own sermon. <laughs> but I've learned that I can go anywhere and pretty quickly start to pick up words if I know what they're talking about. Okay? If, if I know, if I'm in a restaurant and I know they're talking about food, I can pay attention. Pretty soon I'll know this means meat, this means whatever, or in church, you, no, I, you can quickly pick up the words for spirit, for Christ, for things. You understand, but it helps you know what they're talking about. What is the Father talking about? This is the basic issue. There's, some, there's something basic that in all of his conversation, this is what he's talking about. And I think we really need to understand this if we're going to understand his language and what he's saying to us. But if you want a scripture for a heavenly language, 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 13, it says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the Lord, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. And he's not just talking about Christianese or where we have terminologies we've developed around, like being born again and filled with, you know, things like that, which the heathen don't have a clue what we're talking about. He's talking about another language. This is more than just Christianese. But if you really want to know his basic message, that I think helps us, and if you're going to learn any other language... You know, you're not going to learn it all at once, but you need to start picking up a few words here and there. If you have a vision, my daughter's learning Chinese right now. I thought that's impossible for anyone but a Chinese to learn. She's picked it up so fast. But there are a few basics you learn. And then you start adding to your vocabulary a couple words a day. I think we really need to have that vision in the things of the Spirit. If we're going to go beyond the elementary things, and growing up into really being able to receive and understand what God's saying. But his basic message to us, I believe, is in 1 Corinthians 1, 10, and 11. It says, He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, his son, Christ, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things upon the earth. In him. So the ultimate purpose of God is that all things are summed up in his son. You want to know what the Lord is saying to you for every single trial you're going through right now? Every situation you're in? You know what the Father's thinking? Christ likeness. I'm trying to conform you to the image of my son. We get that basic thing down. Everything in our life is trying to bring about his nature in us. Our basic calling is to be like him and do the works that he did. So everything in our life, and once we get that down, we can start putting together a few other things. But the basic message of God is his son. Now, in Colossians... 1, 9 and 10, it says, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Okay? This is basic purpose of God for every one of us, that we're filled with the knowledge of his will. That's, that should be normal Christianity so that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, I believe if, if we have a goal, if we're called to the prophetic ministry, or have prophetic gifts, you can have prophetic gifts and be called as an evangelist or pastor or 
whatever else, but if you have these, I believe our goal should be to see the church filled with the knowledge of God's will. Every believer, knowing their purpose, knowing their calling in Christ, being filled with that knowledge. Why? So that they may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You know, if you're filled with the knowledge of His will, if you know with confidence and boldness, I am in the will of God for my life, you live different. You live with a confidence and a boldness and a humility that is different. Now, I do believe you can do both. You can be confident and bold and humble at the same time. But don't you want to walk that way? Don't you want to live that way, knowing you're in the will of God? That's our call. That's basic. That should be fundamental to all of us. And I believe it is a part of the responsibility of prophetic ministry in the church to help the whole church be filled with the knowledge of His will. And if this isn't happening, we have to say this failure is happening on our watch. Because this is one of the purposes, to impart that. Proverbs 4, 18 and 19 says, But the path of the righteous is like the light of the dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. The normal Christian life, there is increasing light every day. Increasing clarity. If this is not happening with us, somehow we've missed the path. We made a wrong turn somewhere because the path of the righteous or that, that is right shines brighter and brighter until you're walking in the fullness of the light, the full day. Okay, we shouldn't settle for anything less in our life. None of us. And I know you, to be here at a conference like this, you know, you're in pursuit of this. You pursue, you will get it. You will find it. But you can't settle for anything less in your life. What does the next verse say? Uh, verse 19 there says, the way of the wicked is like darkness. They don't even know over what they stumble. The tragedy is, I believe, the overwhelming majority of Christians are walking according to that second verse rather than the first. Stumbling all the time. Getting ambushed by the devil continually. They should be setting up ambushes for the devil. Instead, they're constantly attacked, constantly subjected to this stuff. That is not normal Christianity. We need to see it. No, no, there's got to be a change here somewhere. You know, I remember one time I had a dream that uh, the way this works, I had a dream one night, woke up 3 o'clock in the morning, just sweating because of this dream. It meant a whole radical change in our ministry coming up. And, you know, it was major. I got up and wrote it down, always write down the time, because sometimes the time is part of the message. And this meant a real major turn in our whole ministry. Next morning, about 9 o'clock in the morning, a friend of mine, Bob Jones, calls me. He said, I saw you last night at 3 o'clock in the morning. And he then started telling me the dream that I dreamed. Then gave me the interpretation. Then he rebuked me. He said, if you just had a little faith, the Lord wouldn't have to wake me up. That's true. That's, Bob's a unique person. But, uh, <laughs> but the point is, I made those changes with such incredible boldness, such incredible confidence. That needs, that's normal Christianity. That's what you see in the Bible. That's the way it should be, where if we've got major changes to make, you know, the Lord really speaks and gives us clarity. There should be increasing clarity in light doesn't mean that you're not going to need faith and not need wisdom. But when we need it, we need to get it, okay? What do we know about the last days? Acts 2, 17, 18. The last days he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And what's going to be the result of that pouring out of his spirit? And your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. Your old men are going to dream dreams. Your young men are going to see visions. This is happening throughout the body of Christ right now. By the way, I don't believe, I think that is a mistranslation when it says he will pour out his spirit on all flesh. 
The word translated all there is often translated whole. The word translated flesh is often translated body. He's not going to pour out his spirit on all human beings. The very next verse says, this is upon his bondservants. But I believe he is pouring out his spirit upon the whole body. Many, for many years, I've been telling leaders of denominations and, and all that did not believe that God spoke any more prophetically, I told them, I don't care if you believe it or not, you're going to get it. And you're going to like it. I just asked them, I said, do you believe we're in the last days? And they all, oh yes, of course. I said, what does this verse say? This is going to happen in the last days. This is one of the major signs of the last days. But that's not coming just so we have better meetings. To make our life more entertaining, in the last days, we're going to need that kind of direction, that kind of guidance. So we really need to learn this language now. I tell you, the leaders of many, you would not believe how many of them right now have come back and said, it's happening to us. It is happening to us. It's happening to our people. We, many years ago, told the leaders of the Southern Baptists in our country, over one million Baptists are about to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. That happened. That's past tense now. The whole body, this is, he is going to pour out his Spirit on the whole body. Now, those of us who have had this and we've been walking in the Spirit, we've got to grow up. We've got to help these folks. We've got to be taking the ground. We need to know this language. We need to have those recognize those who have gifts of interpretation of dreams and visions so they're in their place able to help people and most people who get revelation don't do a good very good job interpreting their own revelation these are different gifts these are different languages but we need to start fitting together into those teams that God has called we're gonna need power how are we going to be witnesses of an almighty God without power? We've got to have power. And it's going to increase. It's going to increase dramatically. How do we start? You know, it's interesting how in 2 Corinthians 9, Paul makes a big deal out of he now who, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He says, you will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. Now, we tend to stop short, and we tend to apply this to money. I believe it applies to everything. Money is the least valuable resource that we have. Much better to have the anointing. Much rather have one word from God. What value could you ever put on one word from God? But money is a resource. It's one he used to train us and discipline us by. He said, how can I trust you with the riches of the heaven if you can't deal with these, you know, earthly riches? We have to deal, we have to deal with it right. But it is the least valuable resource. I think a lot of these things we need to look at them first spiritually rather than just how they apply to money. Okay? But then it looks like the goal of this is to produce thanksgiving to God. You know, probably the most radical change would come to most Christians' lives and could change radically and dramatically instantly by just turning their complaining into thanksgiving. That one thing. Why? Because what does it say in Psalm 100? Enter his gates with thanksgiving. As courts with praise. You want to dwell in the presence of the Lord, be a thankful person. Start thanking Him for everything. I set my mind a long time ago to every day I try to get up and try to make my first thought thanksgiving to God. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for my family. Thank you for the church. Thank you for the city. Thank you for. And just try to start and keep that. And then you start finding yourself just worshiping God. So you go deeper into his courts with praise. You hear what I'm saying? Number one reason why that first generation did not enter the kingdom was their grumbling and complaining. Don't grumble or complain about anything. Thank the Lord for it. Fastest way through the wilderness is to be a thankful person, not a complaining person. 
So I believe it should be. Just like Paul here, all of this, this multiplying back of the seed and this, they're being enriched for all of their liberality produced thanksgiving, and that was the goal that Paul was after. Make these thankful people. And I think we should have in our, as our goal, too, in ministry to be imparting this. Help people to be thankful to God for all that he has. But keeping in mind, always, Jesus is the word. And Jesus is the word that the Father is speaking to us. In everything he's trying to do or say, he's intending to bring forth the image of his Son. That's why it says, Revelation 19.10, for the spirit of Jesus is, I mean, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Our goal, to me, if there is a true apostolic call, is what Paul said when he says, I am in labor until Christ is formed in you. I think, tragically, many try to become apostolic by getting people, by trying to impart a form you know, if the church would just conform to this form or do this thing right or whatever. It's all technique. Paul didn't do it that way. He was trying to impart a person. To see the person of Jesus formed in his people. I think we also need to understand that a main reason that God speaks to us is it doesn't have to be strategic doesn't have to be all these things, but a whole lot of it is relationship. I asked a guy one time, I said, he's telling me, well, the Lord doesn't have to speak to us anymore. He gave us the Bible. The Bible's complete and perfect, so he never doesn't have to speak to us anymore prophetically. I said, where is that in the Bible? The one verse he could show with me is so ambiguous, so unclear, where it says, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part will be done away with, and it says there will prophesy in part. I said, wait a minute. It also says we know in part. And that knowledge will be done away with. Has your knowledge been done away with? You see how ridiculous some of these things can be? But then I said, wait a minute. How would you feel if you were a bride and on your wedding day, your husband came up to you in the wedding, said, darling, I wrote this book for you so that I'd never have to speak to you again. What kind of relationship would that be? I mean, don't we determine the quality of any relationship is going to be dependent on the quality of the communication. And a whole lot of what the Lord speaks to us, it's just relational. He wants to be a part of your day, He wants to be a part of your job, wants to be a part of everything. He really does. And uh, He loves us and He wants to communicate with us. I tell you, the Lord really, really loved walking with Adam. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Loves walking with us every day. He just, you know, if you will walk with him, it will really bless him. And he's trying to call us into that. And, you know, there's a sense in so much of the church that we can't approach him until we become perfect or whatever, you know, that uh, when we get good enough, holy enough, mature enough, whatever, then we can, you know, we'll enter the holy of holies or whatever. The opposite is true. You don't get perfected so you can enter his presence. You get perfected by entering his presence. We come boldly before him, whatever condition we're in, and we get changed by beholding his glory. One of them's a religious spirit. One of them is the truth. He wants us to come now. You know, the other is self-righteousness. But <clears throat> we need to have as a basic vision also. In 2 Corinthians 3, 7 and 8, it says, But if the ministry of death and letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face, fading as it was, how shall the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? 
Now he's saying by this, as he goes on to say in the other verse, the glory of the new covenant is much greater than the glory of the former covenant. Much greater. So we need to have a vision of walking in even more glory than they walked in then. Okay, this is not presumption, it's a calling. It is a calling. Now let's just take the prophetic ministry as an example. Under the Old Covenant, there were prophets in Israel who knew even what their heathen kings were saying in their innermost chambers, they couldn't hide a thing from them. The servants of the heathen kings told them, said, listen, there are prophets in Israel that know what you're talking about in your deepest, innermost chamber. You can't hide anything from these guys. Where are they today? This says to me what we're supposed to be walking in and the new covenant is supposed to be better than that. There were prophets under the old covenant that were shocked when anything happened that they did not foresee. Remember one of them says, he, he was shocked. He said, how could this have happened without me seeing it? He said, the Lord must have hidden it from me. Today we're shocked if we do see something. I mean, you see, there's a little distinction. I'm not trying to condemn us for where we are, but we need to realize where we are and realize how far we've got to go. New covenant prophetic ministry is supposed to be walking in more glory, more power than the old covenant. The glory of the new covenant is greater. Where are the Elijahs? Okay, I know this. Before the end of this age comes, we're going to see them. We're, people are going to walk in prophetic ministry that goes way beyond anything seen in the old covenant. And he will prove for all time that the glory of the new covenant is much greater than that former covenant. That was a ministry of death, of condemnation. You hear what I'm saying? We need to have a vision for that. We need to be asking for it. We need to be pursuing it, seeking it. None of us are going to get it because we're any better. We're not going to get it because we're smarter, more righteous. No, we're going to get it because of the cross. Jesus paid the price for it. It's a new covenant. It's a better covenant. He said the things that he did and even greater things would we do. Where are those greater works? He rebuked me recently in a dream. He said, you're called to move literal mountains. I've been teaching how we move mountains today. We move mountains of problems and mountains, all this. The Lord rebuked me in a dream. He said, no, you're going to say to Pike's Peak, be plucked up and cast into the sea and it will obey you. He said, before the end of this age comes, that will be done to prove that my word is true. He said, literal mountains are going to be plucked up. One of my sons came back from a Star Wars movie and he just asked me, he said, Dad, do you think we could ever move things like Luke Skywalker did and just point to him and move them around? I tell you, the Holy Spirit rose up me and he said, you tell your son, yes, he can say to this mountain, be plucked up, moved into the sea. You know, I was really disturbed. I was having to spend some time out in Hollywood with some things and, uh, you know, it... Uh, I don't want to go too far there, but, you know, they are really, there's a, there is a, I believe, a demonic strategy to addict the coming generation to witchcraft and things like that, supernatural. I was really disturbed. I was really agitated by the kind of witchcraft and witches and warlocks that had great influence in Hollywood and stuff like that. You know what the Lord said to me? He said, don't be upset with that. He said, let Hollywood run wild. He said, let them go with their wildest imagination about the supernatural. X-Men, all this stuff they do. He said, let them go as wild as they can, and then I'm going to trump them. <laughs> yeah. 
He said, what I do in real is going to go beyond any of your imaginations. He's going to show the power of the new covenant in him and the authority. Somebody's going to walk in that. I don't have anything better to do. I remember after he gave me that dream about moving that mountain. I, in this dream, it was a powerful dream. In this dream, I went to someone's house and they were moving all this real heavy furniture around and everything. I said, just stand back, I'll do it. And I went like this and all the furniture moved around, just went right where it was supposed to go. Man, that was the best feeling. I could go outside and lift up my car. It's stuck in traffic. I'll put it over here, you know. And I said, man, this is it. This is what... <clears throat> So I wake up, there's a glass of water. <laughs> <You know. laughs> I said, well, maybe I ought to start with this pencil. <laughs> you know, but uh, it's not like that. And you know, there are cults and all that go around, do levitate stuff and everything. By the way, we had a major victory over that. Uh, huge victory. They came to our state. What's, I'm talking about the top Maharishi, I think the Dalai Lama was involved in all this. They built this huge transcendental meditation center in North Carolina. Spent hundreds of millions of dollars. Flew in, brought in people. I think they had six or eight hundred people full-time chanting. And built these huge centers they said the cheapest place there, the cheapest house, was a million-dollar house. And it fills a mountain. You wouldn't believe hundreds and hundreds of these, you know, condominiums and apartments and places. And the Maharishi came there. And we prayed because some of them started putting out the word that they were going to shut us down. They were right across the valley from us. They said they are going to shut down Morningstar, which was our ministry. And then pretty soon we found some satanic, you know, sacrifices and things like that on our property. And it had some power. They did have power. No, no question about that. So we just prayed and said, Lord, bind that thing and don't let that spirit work over there and either convert those people, either get them into the kingdom or get them out of here. And uh, a few, just a couple of months ago, a bunch of pastors from that, that town where they are came over to meet with us and they said, they're abandoning the TM Center. And then a, it came out in the newspaper that they had literally abandoned the whole thing. The Maharishi had come there, tried to levitate this stuff, couldn't do anything. Couldn't levitate a single thing. So finally, he said, this is his response. The spirit isn't right here. And they pull out and have abandoned this huge TM center. I mean, literally, they invested hundreds of millions of dollars in this thing, and it's empty right now. And I'm, you know, I was like you. I was really rejoicing. Hallelujah, you know, that's ours. The Lord said, you don't realize. You do need to occupy that place. And uh, he reminded me, if you cast a demon out, it'll wander around. And if you don't fill that place, it'll come back seven times worse, you know, so with seven, time, seven more, seven times worse. And the Lord said, it's true here, too. You've got to occupy that place. It's empty. And when I was on this trip, I was in Cape Town, South Africa, before going to Australia, and then here, and I called up an old friend of mine, Bruce Wilkinson, who wrote that book on the uh, Jabez prayer and all that. I called Bruce. He's moved to South Africa now. And uh, I was telling Bruce about this TM Center because we'd gone through some spiritual warfare together before years ago. And uh, Bruce starts giving me this word. You've got to occupy that place. You need to go to the owners and get them to give it to you. Know, so he was giving me a prophetic word about it. And that's true. You know, I was just happy. The, these folks are gone. Now we've got this huge responsibility. That's okay, but I think we can do it in the Lord, you know. But we really need to have a vision. I mean, the devil's doing a lot of stuff, but he only counterfeits what the Lord's doing. Don't be upset with that. Yeah, all this levitation. 
I want to be able to say to this mountain or say to this car if I need to. Be plucked up. There is something real there, but we can't just do it. It's not a matter of discipline. It's not a matter of chanting or anything else. It's a being obedient to the Lord. When he gave me a dream when I was in Perth, Australia many years ago, he said, I'm going to show you how to do the greater works. He said, Peter did not walk on the water. He walked on my word. He said, my word has more substance than the firmament. He said, when I said come, Peter could walk on that. I mean, it's a better matter of obedience, abiding in him. I mean, right now, if I had the authority to move mountains, I'd be making a mess of things. I'd be right down there now at Mount Cook saying, we want you in North Carolina. <laughs> I'd be working up the greater works. I'd be saying, you know, we love, uh, we love New Zealand, but it's just too far away. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? I mean, we need some maturity here, and we need to understand, you know, you know, witchcraft is trying to manipulate what we're talking about is obedience and abiding in him and becoming so trustworthy he can trust us because we have his mind and his heart. Okay, we understand, but we're after power. Make no mistake about it. This is a power confrontation at the end. We want power. We want power to heal AIDS every time. We want to heal cripples. We want to heal cancer. We don't want anything to... We want that power. We want that authority. We want to demonstrate for all time that the glory of the new covenant is much greater than anything before. We want to demonstrate to the degree that even the Jews, who are right now saying, where are your Elijahs? Where, you know, you didn't have anything compared to what we have. We want to do something that will make them jealous. And say, we never had anything like this. Because of not who we are, but because of the God we serve and the covenant that he has given to men. Okay? And that's what he said. Remember what he said about John the Baptist. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He who is least in this covenant can walk in something greater than John somebody's going to really get that. And they're going to start walking it. They're going to start going. Their path is going to get brighter and brighter every day. They're going to set us up. This is the pursuit of their life. And they're going to do it. And they have some breakthroughs. A few more are going to say, well, we can do it. That idiot can do it. I know I can do it. And that's why he likes to use the foolish to confound the wise. I think Steve preached his message on the disciples, but they were a mess. That's what made it. You know, those people looking up there at those 12 on the day of Pentecost, saying, aren't these the guys that just denied the Lord? Ran for their lives when he needed them the most? They were cowards. They were, these are the leaders of his church? These are the guys we're supposed to follow? You know, the only way they're going to follow him is they had to be anointed. They had to be anointed. It's the anointing. It's the presence of the Lord. That's what we're after. It's not who we are. It's who he is. It's who he is. But I believe we need to set some goals. You know, John was the last, and I believe the greatest of an order, but the new order is supposed to be greater. We need to set our sights on something much more. And we're not going to get there, probably not tomorrow. We could. Because the Lord, with him, a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. We probably, you know, we may look at our life and say, I've been walking with God for 30 years, and I've hardly done anything, and he can jump you all the way to the end in one day. Okay, he can do that. Usually he doesn't. Usually it's a matter of, you know, those who want it have to seek, ask, knock. It's a drive of their life. It's a consuming desire of their life is to do his will, 
to serve Him. But I believe we do need to set that goal of walking in something greater than anything in the Old Covenant and to come to the place where, starting off, we're never surprised by any world events. See them coming before they happen. We should have the goal of walking in more power and more glory. Now, there's a whole aspect of this. I want to wait and talk about tonight. It's, It's fundamental. To understand his language is understanding his heart. The most basic issue, it's about his son. The ultimate purpose of God is the summing up of all things in his son. And if you don't keep that ultimate purpose of God as your focus, you'll be continually distracted by the lesser purposes. Pretty soon you're trying to build a whole church on a a doctrine or something. It's a great doctrine, great truth. That's not what the Father's doing. We constantly get distracted from the river of life by all the little tributaries that feed it. His whole focus, it's his son. And everything he created in the first chapter of Colossians, everything was made through him and for him, and in him all things hold together. In everything, he's looking for his son, and that's the main thing he's looking for in us, his son. It's not how much we pray, that's a good thing. Not just how much we study, that's a good thing, or how much we go to church. All those are great and they can help. The main thing he's looking for is his son. Every trial in our life, Every test that we're enduring right now is that for that purpose. Now, we usually get in a state of mind where we're thinking God's using this to deal with other people. No, he's using it to try to get us informed. One of those things Francis used to say all the time, you know, you never fail one of God's tests. You just keep taking it until you pass. Now, a lot of us just taking the same test over and over again. We're not passing We're not passing the test. You know how you pass? You die. He'll never let you be tempted beyond what you're able to endure, but will always provide a way of escape. And that way of escape is always the same. Just die. He's not trying to just change us. He's trying to kill us. We want to walk in the power of God The cross is the power of God. You want to know the power of God in your daily life? Take up your cross daily. How we miss those opportunities. You know, it doesn't it say by His stripes we're healed? I think I talked about this last time I was here. By His stripes we're healed. The same is true of us. You want to receive authority for healing? You know, if you were an abused child, you can have authority for healing others of that same wound. God doesn't do this stuff to us, but he allows it to happen for a reason. It's impossible for the devil to get a shot in while God isn't looking. Why, when Paul the Apostle, when his apostolic authority was challenged, how did he defend himself? He pointed to his sufferings. He said, I was beaten, I was stoned, I was shipwrecked, all this. That's what he pointed to as the evidence of his authority. We need to start seizing these opportunities. Every time you're offended, if you start responding the right way, seize that as an opportunity to die. I believe, you know, he says, take up your cross daily. I believe he gives every one of us an opportunity to to take up the cross every day. And most of us obliviously just go right through life, don't even see these incredible opportunities to see his power. And to be identified with him. But if we would, we would change. And we would be able to heal others. Now, I'm going to finish this with this. But you know, uh, we've got a, doctor friend of mine that can explain this a lot better than I could, but you know how your mind runs off of electrical impulses. 
And uh, each thought is like a billionth of an amp or something like that. But your mind actually runs off of electricity. And that's why some of the foods and nutrients are better conductors of electricity, and they will affect your thinking. You know, some of them are worse. They're, I don't want to get into all that. But if you think a thought, it's like from this point, you know, there's a arc electrical connection made to another point. But if you think the same thought over and over, it builds a bridge. And then they say that's when that thought becomes your subconscious. It becomes your subconscious mind. And your subconscious mind is really who you are. Okay? Somewhere around 75 to 85% of our decisions every made are subconscious decisions. It's what the Bible calls the spirit of a man. For example, you're a Christian, new Christian, you read, fruit of the spirit is patience. You get into traffic, <laughs> this guy cuts you off, you grit your teeth and say, I would be giving him ungodly symbols, but I'm a Christian now. I'm going to be patient. You just grit your teeth and be patient. Right? And that's good. That's where you start. But after you've done it over and over and over, your mind's been renewed. And now you have bridges built. Neuro passageways, they call them. And that's who you are. Then you go into that situation. You don't even have to think, I've got to be patient here. I grip my teeth. You just are patient. You don't have to grit your teeth and say, I've got to love this brother. I want to kill him, but I'm going to love him because that's the word. No, you get in those situations and you just love them. It's natural because it's who you are. Now, that's the way Christianity is supposed to be. There is a process where our minds need to be renewed through life. It's part of the process God uses us. But this is called a Christian walk, isn't it? Walking is one of the most unconscious things we do. I mean, when you walk, you don't think, well, I've got to put this foot here. Now I better put this one right here. You just walk. That's the way our Christianity is supposed to be. Okay? That's why the Lord keeps putting us in situations. If you ever pray for patience, you know how... Yeah, I don't pray those prayers anymore. God does enough without us asking Him, inciting Him. Or something, but but if he's putting us in situations over and over, it's because he's trying to change. And if we would just lay down our lives, embrace the cross, embrace the cross, die to ourselves, our selfishness, everything else. Now, to me, one of the greatest demonstrations I ever saw of the kingdom of God was in an airport ticket line. I want to finish with this. It's an example of what I'm talking about. We were in a serious third world country ticket line. And the plane was about to leave. The ticket agents were hardly getting anybody through. They were just not processing anybody, didn't care. They were being mad and angry with everybody. And the tension in this ticket line, there was a lot of people there. The tension was rising and rising and rising. And I'm sitting there thinking, we're going to have a riot. We are going to burn this terminal building down. I mean, they don't realize the fire. I mean, this, you could just see the anger and the tension and the rising in this crowd of people. The worst possible moment. These two very large, really boisterous women came pushing and shoving right through the middle of that crowd, hitting people with their luggage, saying, get out of the way, we're going to the front. I was sure, I saw this, I said, I was sure somebody's going to deck them. And deep in my heart I was saying, let me at them. I wanted to do it, yeah, I wanted to do it, but, you know, it, it couldn't have been a worse, I said, this is it, this is the spark that caused the explosion that will 
burn this place down. You know what I mean? This is going to be a riot. At that moment, this friend that I was with, a missionary friend of mine, he turns around, he sees these women, and, and you know, they're about to be, I mean, there is rage in this place. He turns around, sees them, and instantly goes, ladies, ladies, please let me help you. And nobody, it was like the breath was taken out of the place. Nobody thought of helping them. We all wanted to hit them. <laughs> they were stunned. Because you could tell they were so used to people reacting to them because of the way they were, they were just stunned. And I, it got really quiet. And this friend of mine, Raul, went over and grabbed their bags. He said, please let me help you. Walked back over to the line. He, he said to me, he said, Let's give them our place in the line. And he asked the people behind us, would you mind if we gave them our place? And they, no, no. Everybody's staring at the situation. So put their bags down, and they're just standing there like they couldn't believe it, and we just walk to the back and stand. I could see everybody's just staring at, Raul, who is this guy? But it so changed the spirit of that place. Where there was rage and about to be war, I mean, just bloodshed, mania, I mean, it was about to be. Didn't Jesus say, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And here was just, to me, you know, isn't the one who lives in us called the helper? And Raul, you know, he didn't just become that way. I've known him for many years I know the way he has tried to every day embrace the cross. Anytime something comes his way where he has to lay down his life, he seizes the opportunity. He didn't do that. If that had been a fake thing, he would not have had the anointing. But it was so much who he was. It was the spirit of Christ in him. It was so real, so powerful, absolutely dissipated that evil spirit. Isn't he called the Prince of Peace? Have you ever wondered... Well, you know, the Lord, the title used for the Lord more than ten times more than any other title is Lord of hosts, Lord of armies, and yet it says it's the God of peace who will soon crush Satan under your feet. The peace of God is so powerful. It's the linchpin, fruit of the Spirit. You know what a linchpin is? Holds all the other parts together. Think about it. You remove, if you lose your peace, you're going to lose your patience. You're going to lose your love, your joy. Peace is crucial. That's why I believe almost every assault of the enemy is fundamentally trying to steal our peace. And it was the peace of God, the patience that right here in this situation, the kingdom of God came into that thing, took over. Those ticket agents immediately wanted to help everybody. There was a spirit of everybody wanting to help everybody. Everybody got on the plane. The kingdom of God came there. Why aren't we doing that at the office? Why aren't we those vessels at the shopping center? Right now, we do what I wanted to do in that thing. I wanted to get in the riot. I wanted to stay, you know, I was... No, no. No, we've got to go beyond this. It's got to be who we are. The point is, don't waste your trials. Don't waste them. Don't keep taking them over and over. You know what the reward is for passing a test in the Lord? A bigger test. <laughs> but you know what? You know, that was great for that ticket counter and that ticket. Somebody's going to do that for cities. Somebody's going to do that for countries. And instead of going to war with each other, you know, Switzerland was created on a prophetic word. You guys realize that? Seven cantons, who were the leaders of these seven provinces in Switzerland, tried to meet, work out their problems, this is in Swiss history books. Tried to work out the problems, couldn't do it. They decided they're going to war the next day with each other. 
this priest came in and said, will you give us one more day? I'm going to go to a man who hears from God, Nicholas of Flu, and he heard from the Lord so clearly. Everybody knew his reputation. He said, will you give me one day? This man went through the snow all night long to Nicholas's place. By the way, he's a guy many of us call St. Nicholas. It's amazing the way things get twisted. But uh, went to Nicholas of Flu's place. Nicholas gave him a word to carry back to these men, and instead of going to war with each other, they formed a nation. And that's why I think Switzerland to this day has an anointing for making peace among nations. There's an anointing there. Now, I wish I could tell you that whole story. It's really remarkable about this. But the kingdom of God, we're here to be messengers of the kingdom, ambassadors for the kingdom. Well, if we're not faithful in the little things, how is he going to make us ruler of the many? We've got to start being faithful in our home, our family. Our churches. I mean, right now the churches are where you can get beat up worse than anybody. Where this has got to change. It can change here. It can change here. Light will cast out darkness. When you raise your shades at night, darkness doesn't come in the room. Light is more powerful. We've been given the light. Lord, I just pray for every one of these. They're so hungry they would give up their Saturday like this pursuit of you and knowing your I ask for increasing light in their life that it would increase day by day until they walk in the fullness of the light in the fullness of your purpose for their life in Jesus name amen I think my time's up yeah.